Hello. Today I have a film to show you which was shot at HMF Solutions in South West London, talking about a product which came out in 1980 and the recreation of that product for today, the IAS Bewley loudspeaker system. A loudspeaker with very, very unique uh, possibilities in its design brief, which engendered a very high performance loudspeaker system. The video was uh, conducted with Steve Harris of Hi-Fi News interviewing the co-designer and engineer of IAS Integrated Audio Systems, David Hall, and myself. This is the new loudspeaker, the 40R. In it you'll hear discussions about all the different factors that went into designing this, which is a recreation of the original, the IAS Bewley, back in 1980. And you can see in the video here that we have some of the earlier speakers of that period on show. This is a loudspeaker I felt worthy of relaunching as the original had so many possibilities. This included discussing with various manufacturers of the products which make up the speaker complement, along with cabinet makers, the crossover component designs, and a number of other factors besides. So without further ado, let's move over to the film. This is the story of a loudspeaker that was originally designed more than 40 years ago, but it's recently been transformed into a modern high-end design uh, by Carl Beckwith. And so I'd like to ask you, Carl, how did you first encounter the IAS Bewley as it then was? My first encounter with the IAS Bewley was at the Cunard Hi-Fi 80 show in Hammersmith. My late father took me along to this show, knowing I had an interest in Hi-Fi, and I went to see all these different manufacturers, of which IAS were one of the exhibitors. I collected all the brochures, as you did back then as a youngster, and in getting home I read all the details on the different products. I didn't really notice the sound at the show because I was listening to various products, but it was upon getting home and reading all the information and these specifications which were amazing, but it was a later encounter which got me familiar with just what it was capable of. But when was that next encounter with the IS Bewley? I was working in retail in 1981 for a hi-fi specialist local to me called Essex Hi-Fi, where they had these speakers, the Bewley, as their top of the range speaker. This was the new product in 1980 that I'd seen the year before, and in listening to them in this showroom with top-end equipment like the Trio LO7D, the Trio KA907 amplifier and the Revox B77, we had direct cut records and we had some pretty good equipment and the sound was nothing short of spectacular and that informed the strongest memories. In fact, one memory was of a recording that the manager had made of his 1000cc BMW motorbike racing off of his driveway and coming back and then blowing the horn and it was like you were in his driveway. Amazing sound. And that memory stuck for a long time. So you were tremendously impressed by the speaker, but I don't think you ended up with a pair then. You went off and did something else and didn't hear them again for a long time. So tell me what happened next. A good many years passed before I revisited this loudspeaker design, owning various systems like the Tannoy Westminster, the original Quad ESL 57 electrostatics, Focal Diablo Utopias, Focal Scala Utopias, and a number of other systems besides. Eventually, I got curious and started looking online to see if a pair of IAS Bewleys were available to buy second hand. And I luckily found a pair from a one owner from New, and I duly purchased these. So what were your impressions once you'd managed to acquire this uh, rather magic pair of the original speakers? After a number of days listening to this pair that I had acquired, there were just so many things that informed a completely different level of performance of which I'd not experienced before from all the other speaker systems I had. As diverse as they were, this was a system that went down far lower, it had a greater transparency, and the dynamic range was far greater than anything I'd heard before. The swing from quiet to loud. And 
At first I thought there might have been some sort of auditory trickery going on, but it was based upon various aspects of the design that I later came to realise through closer examination that was to be the reason why they sounded as good as they did. So what, what was your starting point when you set about really modernising the design and bringing it up to date? i have been listening for quite a while to these newly acquired speakers and there was so much learning in their sound that I realised that this was a very, very overlooked design of supreme qualities and I just began to think that this needed to be revisited. Everything, television broadcasts, radio broadcasts, LPs, it just had a sound performance that was on a different level. From realising how good these speakers were, I went onto the forums online and saw various people discussing. And amongst the contributors online, um, I noticed the co-designer, David Hall, popping up every now and again. And he, along with his late business partner in IAS, Alan Willis, um, they were the people behind this product. David was correcting a few people online about the product's history. So I decided to reach out and make contact. We uh, got into discussion about the notion of having this product revisited and with certain uh, alterations made with quality components, uh, cabinet construction, a number of other things. And piece by piece I got all the information I needed, spoke to different companies that could make this possible. Yeah. Okay, and, and David, I understand you were building transmission line speakers in the early days and probably from magazine designs and so on. But tell me what happened next. You met Alan and then things changed. That's right, yes. Uh, yes, Steve. Um, we, uh, we were building other versions of speakers um, back from 1976. And um, I used to do exhibitions locally um, demonstrating my speakers in hotel rooms and so on and then at one of those places Alan and his father came in and started saying things to me about that he had a better design and so on and so of course I was a bit upset over that <laughs> and uh, so anyhow we, we went back and uh, eventually I got friendly with him um, had a look at some of the designs he'd put together they were so huge and cumbersome and handmade kind of things that I knew they were good sound, but I said, you, you won't be able to sell stuff like this. So he came into our premises, we had a shop then, with workshop facilities at the back, and um, that, that's how it started with him. So we sat down and he started drawing out all these shapes and designs. I said, they're too complicated, and I'll just come up with a very simple design. And he said, that'll work. Because I'd never done a horn-type speaker before, and it, and it worked. We then started using uh, Richard Allen drive units. Uh, they were a famous brand back in the, uh, in the 60s, 70s. And uh, we got to know the directors of that company. So we used to use a lot of their 8-inch drive units initially, because they were paper cone. We realised we had to use paper cone, because they got a better better transient response, they sound better. Uh, they were coated as well. We started coating a lot ourselves with PVA glue or that stuff they used for coating photographs in the old days. And um, it developed from there. And um, so eventually um, we, we got on to making larger speakers. Uh, the Bewley wasn't the first IAS design. Can you tell me about the origins of the range and how you started with, with um, the IAS range? When we had the shop premises, we had lots of speakers on display. We had a lot of equipment. A lot of manufacturers used to come in to see us, see whether we'd be interested in taking on their products. I know that you've told me this before, but can you share with us the story of how you started using the Volt drive unit, which was obviously a pretty significant moment? One, one, it was during winter times, I remember it was quite dark when she came in, it was a young woman, and uh, she said would be interested in this 10-inch base unit. Of course, 
being a young lady as well, we thought, well, what's she know about hi-fi? But anyhow, she did. She knew a lot. And she worked for a company called Gale at the time. We didn't know anything about Vault. And no hi-fi company was using their product. So we, because we had um, workshop facilities at the back, while she was still there, I de de designed a cabinet that I thought it would work in, which is this design we still have and that took the 10 inch base unit. We made up a cabinet while she was still at the premises and we we just cut a hole out for the base unit. We put the bowl, base unit upside down and connected it to a signal generator. You got exceptionally low frequency response and uh, I think that caused you some problems in your workshop, didn't it? There was a, a loose kind of window above the doorway and that just shattered. And uh, we knew we had something because it went down to 13 cycles or 13 hertz. And we thought, wow, this is incredible. It's a hefty beast. And they, weren't, they were very quite expensive even back then for a base unit because Richard Allen's in comparison were quite, quite cheap to buy. And a lot of people would go down that route. But... Uh, you know, we, we decided to go for this because it had a very sturdy chassis, big heavy magnet, the right uh, resonant frequency uh, had to be quite low, and that's why it all worked. It, it was quite amazing how the whole thing just came together. I know you did several versions of the Bewley, but you didn't start off with the Volt base unit, as I understand it. Yes, yeah, so for a mid-range, um, we, we were getting... We were getting manufacturers coming in and asking us if we would could use their units. We had Aldax, Aldax, or however you, way you say it, um, and we we uh, found the uh, Ciaz fitted better because it it was a paper cone, nice nice sturdy magnet. It had a a cast chassis instead of like one of these pressed tin type things. And, and but we had to produce a box for it because it, you didn't have anything on the back and enclosure so we had to use that on the front then the tweeter was a bit more difficult we found a peerless that fitted fitted in and um, we had to do things to it to to make it sound better uh, tell me about the ferrofluid because I think you're one of the innovators of, of ferrofluid in in that uh, peerless yeah. tweeter. We we use that peerless initially, basic as it was, but certain listeners, including my wife, who had brilliant ears, especially back then, could listen her hear up to twenty thousand. Um, she's noticed some kind of sibilance or something that was wrong that we couldn't hear because our hearing doesn't go up that high. This guy came in talking about ferrofluid. We knew nothing about it, but he explained to us what he did. Then after that, we thought we'd try some. So he left us a sample bottle, and after that, we started using it in all of our tweeters, on every model we made then. And of course, for that time, back then, we're talking about late 70s, early 80s, it was the ideal substance to be using then. And so we put that in everything. And um, every every tweeter, not on the other drive units. So we had we had a really great speaker. So when you launched the product at the Hi-Fi show, I gather there was a lot of interest from the Hi-Fi community. Yes, we got a very good response. Uh, the, the show at uh, Cunard was, was good and uh, we, we felt we had a product that was worthwhile. And then we got a good review, and uh, that was, uh, you know, we were ecstatic over that. So I think it was many years later that you discovered that the Bewley had actually become a bit of a cult product by looking at the online forums, and then you were contacted by Carl, yes? We were living in Cyprus at the time. We lived there for 10 years, and my wife said to me, why don't you look online, Google whether there's anything about IAS and so I did that and I came up with this uh, this forum and there was a whole section on IAS speakers and you know people were eulogizing about uh, the Bewley and where could we get them and all this kind of stuff 
and that was it. I mean, I was, but there again, we, we didn't do anything about it. We couldn't do anything about it at that time. I didn't really want to get back into the hi-fi business back then, you know, because I was retired. So now, after all these years, you've actually really got a, a realised finished product again. And uh, thanks to Carl and uh, the work you've done between you, how does that feel? He managed to track me down and, and he went under the logo of British Composers. And, and he, he wrote an incredible piece about the Bewley and about 1980 Cunard show. And he just happened to have all the brochures. And which he sent to me, which was quite incredible. So, because I never had anything from back then, so it was nice. And then we we went went down to meet him when he lived in Essex then, and uh, I heard the Bewleys for the first time in probably forty years, and I was amazed myself, you know. So it was a uh, it was quite an incredible time. Carl would ring me probably nearly every day. It was it was and. and and, and we're both chatterboxes and we just would, would go on and on. And um, so we, we uh, collaborated and uh, come up with ideas how we could improve it. Because see, the thing is back then we were very limited on components. You know, you have certain inductors you could use, a ferrite cord or air cord. There wasn't the choice that you have today. Capacitors were just a, any old capacity you get as a job lot. Uh, nowadays, uh, they're selective. Various capacity electrolytics don't sound as good as some others, and so we we now can get better quality components. Resistors even make a difference, and it is a simple crossover. So you want it to be with the best possible um, components that are available, and uh, so Carl has spared no expense in producing what he's producing now. So, Carl, there's some quite significant names in the original drive unit lineup because you had the Volt and the CS Midrange and the Peerless Tweeter. So, tell me about how you set about uh, looking at what to do with those. First of all, I contacted Volt, who were the manufacturers of the base unit. It's actually a base midrange unit. And CS, and I looked at the online specifications, they hadn't changed the specification apart from the chassis shape a more open back design. And I also tested dozens of treble units because I knew that that was the part that informed the sound, which was very difficult. What I wanted to avoid was to not alter the crossover design, which was very specific. And it's a series crossover, which has a low component count. It allows for greater dynamic range, more open sound, and as a consequence, a lot of engineers in the business are saying that's not how you design the speaker. You've got to design the crossover around the treble unit. I went against the grain. I wanted to find a treble unit that would drop in, that would work well. And it was a very difficult search. And lots of units were rejected in the course of the testing in the original cabinets. I basically reversed engineered things with the original speaker system. Um, well, I know you've kept the horn loading and the basic configuration of the cabinet as exactly as the original, but you've used different materials and used a lot of different design techniques, so maybe you could just tell me what you've actually done in the construction of the cabinet. Well, what's occurred since then are manufacturing techniques which are far, far more advanced with CNC machining, uh, different materials are used, so chipboard, as good as it sounds, is not an ideal material to work with in production, and I'm not even sure that any companies are using chipboard these days. So I was investigating through a professional company that makes cabinets with a very good contact who's worked with me on this, and uh, we worked together to uh, come up with a design that had structural integrity at the core of the design along with using materials like the birch plywood baffle that we're using that has a more attractive look in a contemporary living environment. So a little bit of borrowing from some famous uh, designers um, with, uh, uh, I can't, probably can't mention names here, but there were certain uh, armchairs you used to see in the receptions of lobbies with chrome sections. So I've got stainless steel sections on the sides of this cabinet and what I thought looked good were guitar strings down the front of the baffle and a stand which would incorporate all the crossover components which are quite large 
I didn't want them in the cabinet. That made a big difference. All sorts of things which not just were for looks, but in some instances informed the performance of the loudspeaker. This was an area, the crossover, which I had to be very careful with. And yet some of the treble units which I was testing warranted higher quality components than what were in the original crossover, which used fairly stock um, manufacture resistors capacitors, inductors. And along the way I got to look into the industry of boutique uh, companies making some middling priced and some very expensive components to see whether there was any truth in the performance criteria. And there are plenty of people out there who will criticise against the use of expensive components but I'm here to say that the differences with these components really informed on the end result. So I went through so many before reaching at what I finally put into these speakers, gave the best sound. I had at the very start a vision that this was a speaker system with some very, very unique virtues. And so I felt that wherever I could hear an improvement I was willing to go the distance in investing. That's not to say that at a later stage there might not be the possibility of scaling down a less expensive product, but I wanted to see how far we could go to getting the ultimate version of this original loudspeaker system. And I feel that this has been achieved. So this is really a no holds barred interpretation of the original design? Everything possible went into this. And at the time I had uh, reserves of money in which to explore all sorts of possibilities and no accountant to tell me that I couldn't do it. Well I know you've obviously kept the original configuration of the horn loading and so on but the cabinet actually has had a lot more work on it and I was looking at the back and saw this very substantial um, metal plate on there and maybe you could tell me what that's doing. With the materials that we have used we have a birch plywood baffle we have MDF on the cabinet, the best grade that could be uh, acquired through the expert guidance from the furniture company who understands their wood intimately. There are some companies who make speakers who will say that that's not the material to use, but it's actually the most practical material to use. Given that this cabinet has um, quite a, a, a unique loading combination, it's not unique to have quarter wave, which is what this has, but it has other things besides just quarter wave loading. It makes the cabinet very rigid, but one panel on this speaker, um, which is unsupported, I felt warranted some further damping. We don't put damping uh, like other companies do because that does blunt the dynamics, but on the back is an aluminium plate with EVA foam underneath clamped which is like a dampener, but on the exterior of the back panel. This made a big difference to the sound quality. After extensive listening, I finally bit the bullet and I went for testing what are regarded as probably the top of the range boutique handmade components available. And these are from Denmark and they're from Duland a lot of very positive comments from people who are mainly in the market of building systems for themselves, never the intention of going into production, have used these components. They're expensive, but the differences in the performance I heard were akin to informing of musical instrument sounds as you would expect to hear them. It would just sound less hi-fi, more like an instrument. And the design of the speaker system was such that with its transparency and its extended range and its openness, these were the components that delivered the best results by quite a margin. The design of this system remains faithful to the original in many, many key areas. Um, the volt unit, it is slightly better in balance. This was realised through Volt, who worked with me on this in recreating their first generation B250 drive unit. They're now onto the eighth generation, but this has a different compliance, a lower fundamental resonant frequency. Um, the CS unit, the treble unit goes further than the original, 
though the original was an exceptionally good unit for these speakers. In fact, back in the day, IAS was one of the first companies to use ferrofluid, which is what went into the Peerless treble unit, which was in the original design. Uh, we now have a, a unit from Accuton, which is a ceramic unit, and I'm still looking out there for anything new that might come out, because treble units are very critical. People don't realise until they're designing a speaker how it informs the tightness and speed of the system as a whole. Now the Volt unit in this, in what is a vented design, is exceptionally fast. Bass speed that I've never heard from any other loudspeaker system unless you're using massive amplifiers that uh, are very, very current hungry. This system can be used with amplifiers of more humble means. The original design has got um, the same component values. That was pure accident, um, but it is exactly the same on this system with this Accuton unit. And the proportions and the uh, internal works, the ratios are all the same as Alan Willis and David Hall designed. And the difference in this design is that this crossover is separate from the speaker to reduce microphonic aspects by being inside the stand, which is why the stand is as wide and as deep as it is. We have pure copper contacts on the terminals, which inform a better transfer of the signal. And we don't use solder joints. I noticed that solder actually added noise because there's all sorts of mains noise that will creep into a system at every turn if you're not careful. We've done everything we can on this. The only place that you'll find solder within this speaker system is on the tags of the speaker units themselves. Uh, there's clearly a, an isolation system between the stand and the speaker, as uh, I can see here. So uh, tell me what you've done in that regard. The loudspeaker stand was an area that I wanted to see greater scope with for the performance of the speaker system as a whole. So as well as reducing microphony by separating the crossovers from the speaker and also the very powerful magnet in the speaker from the inductors, I decided to take a leaf out of the research that was put in by the late Max Townsend of Townsend Audio where he had made isolation platforms for various things, including, amongst other things, loudspeakers and grand pianos. And the vibration control, without going into too much detail, really has its merits. Um, and I experimented with this first before deciding upon adopting the idea. But rather than having the whole system on a floating suspension, which would have been a bit precarious, I decided to have the speaker stand, which is on spikes, to give good stability by having the loudspeaker sat on a platform of sprung pods of the right compliance. And this not only reduces vibration going through to the floor, which in houses with wooden floorboards will create a thickening of the base, losing this very fast and precise delivery, but uh, which improves focus to the sound, but it also reduces the buzzing around of energies in the cabinet. It acts as a drain to the energies. And so what's coming off the drive units and into the air in the room informs a far more precise soundstage between the speakers. And it actually improves the quality of the bass performance as well. And so I decided after trying with and without to incorporate this within the speaker system. I wanted to cover all aspects as best as possible, so that then the only critical factor is the positioning of the speakers in a room that doesn't have a lousy acoustic. There's no way around that. Any speaker system, you need a good acoustic to a reasonable extent. And just to quickly touch base on that, for those who say I use DSP correction, there's a lot of people who will argue vociferously against those measures. Um, I don't want to stand on one side of the camp or the other, but understanding how strongly people feel about having the signal with nothing in between, I sought to try and deal with it in the analog domain as far as was possible. And the end results, these speakers have the speed and timing, almost like an active pair of speakers, but with, I think, a better sense of integration.
That's one area that some people argue against multi-amplifier active systems. At least have a coherence to them. This concludes the video shoot from last autumn. Acknowledgements must go to Ian Bodil for availing the demonstration room at HMF Solutions and of course to Steve Harris who conducted the interview. This is a project which had turned into a marketable loudspeaker which is now available to order and built to order. For serious inquiries please look at www.iasloudspeakers.co.uk Thank you for watching.